morning, everybody. It's our third sermon in our Red Letter Discipleship series. Jesus uh, challenges his, his prods for discipleship. A foundational statement we're using for these, the series is that the missional church happens, church in mission, church on the move, happens when disciples of Jesus Christ connect to engage their passions in the world, connect with God and with each other, to engage. The idea is the engaging part. That's where we're heading. Put it into practice. Their passions in the world, their calling in the world. All the scriptures in this series are coming from Luke 9 and Luke 10. They're all uh, these, these powerful words of Jesus, these, these, these words that are meant to kind of cut through and, and, to, and to reach us, to hit us in the heart. Each one taken by themselves is powerful. Taken together, they are a clear gift and a challenge for us. So we just heard uh, Tom read this one from today. Who do the crowds say that I am? Don't you love this? You see Jesus is the teacher here, or as a good parent. And I remember when we were talking with our kids when they were young, and we would always ask them, what do other people, what are other people doing about that? How are other, that was our way to engage them. Uh, then we would get to what do they think, right? What are they, where are they going? So that's what Jesus does. Who, who do other people say I am? You know, and they, and they say, well, you're, a, you're, you're John the Baptist. You're, you're, the, you're the forerunner of the, of the Messiah. Or you're Elijah, which was the Old Testament forerunner of the Messiah. Okay. Who do you say that I am? And Peter being who he is. Fortunately, there's a Peter in the class. Don't you teachers like to have a Peter that will raise his hand? Yes, I have the answer. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You're Messiah being Christ in Hebrew. Christ and Messiah, same word. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the chosen one. You are the one we've been waiting for. So in college, I had a powerful experience uh, of the Holy Spirit. It, this was, I was Episcopalian, but we had a charismatic experience uh, time when I was a senior in high school, so I had that. Also had a belief in God. I had an understanding that God, God was present. For me, it was, who is Jesus was really the question. So I can remember as a, as a freshman in college reading my good news for, for modern man, remember those, those Bibles? And uh, sitting there at, at Edwards Hall, uh, Allegheny College, that's where I went to college. And uh, just, who is this Jesus? What do I do with him? Um, those of you who have grown up maybe in the Methodist church or in other churches, maybe this question was answered for you early on. Uh, maybe it's the Holy Spirit that's the question, or maybe it's God is the question. But for me, it was Jesus. Who do I think he is? And I could, I could come up with a great teacher. I could come up, this was in college, I could come up with somebody who, who is, is helping me to understand what it means to really be a, a human, be, be a, a person of God. But Lord and Savior, you know, the one that I look to in all things, the way, the truth, and the life, Lord of my life, that was to come later for me. And that's the question, isn't it, for us? Part of it has to do with, with pride. What can one person give me that I can't give myself? I think that's what, we're, what, what we have today. What can somebody else give me that I can't find on my own? We have so many resources now, so, many more, you know, so much more ability to find uh, what answers to our spiritual questions or to any question. So why do I need somebody else in my life? you know, be an authority in some way. I'm my own authority. And that's, that's one of the reasons why who do you say that I am becomes a real challenge. Another one has to do with, with whether we put Jesus, you know, whether we can really identify with him, whether we really do understand that being like him is, is, is where we want to be going in our lives. So there was a, let me, let, there, there's a story in Luke chapter 8 just a little bit ahead of these 9 and 10 uh, chapters that we're looking at right now. This is the story of Jairus' daughter who was sick, dying actually, 
Uh, he's a leader of the synagogue. He asked Jesus for his help, his healing. So Jesus and his disciples are, are moving along to the synagogue, or to, to, the, to Jairus' house, actually, uh, to heal his daughter or to be with her. And there's a crowd with them, and they're all moving along. And with the crowd of people, uh, somehow this woman who has had a, been hemorrhaging for a long time, many years, finds her way through the crowd and pulls on Jesus' cloak, you know, on his robe. And he reels around to see, you know, who did that? Who, who was it that touched me? And she kind of says sheepishly, it was me. You know, I did that. You know, she's kind of hold, you know, pulling, holding back a little bit, pulling back a little bit. And he sees her. He, in that moment, he understands what's going on. He sees her in her pain and in her, in her suffering, and he heals her. And then he goes on to the house where this young girl has since died, and then he brings her back to life. It's quite a, quite a scene. So, question. There's a question. We have a little question for you to, to answer this morning. Of the characters in that biblical story, who do you most strongly identify with? Five choices. One, the bleeding woman, the woman who has been hemorrhaging. Two, the anxious father. Three, the crowd. Four, the disciples. And five, Jesus. Who do you identify with? Right, five choices. Bleeding woman, anxious father, curious crowd, disciples, Jesus. How many people say the bleeding woman? Okay. How many people say the anxious father? Got a lot of anxious parents in here. <laughs> How about the curious crowd? Some crowd people, a few. I see some back here. Disciples. There's a few disciples. Jesus. There's a couple. There's a few. Last night there were two teenage girls who put their hand up for Jesus. I thought, wow, that's... That's something. So this question was posed to a group of 600 people, 600 pastors now, teachers, spiritual counselors, doctors, nurses, all those kind of folks were in a convention and a conference together. This very thing was posed to them. I'm going to see how they responded. And the survey said, no. And the character they most identified with, the bleeding woman, about 100, this is approximate. Anxious father, 150. Curious, most people identified with the crowd in that particular group. Isn't that something? 44 said that they could be identifying with uh, disciples. Six out of 600 said Jesus. Now, what do we think about that? You know, what do we, how, you know, when, we, when we read the Bible, who are we identifying with? Who do we see ourselves in? You know, is Jesus that far beyond us that only six out of 600, there's just a few in this room, could even imagine identifying with him? We can see ourselves in the people in need or the people that are kind of around, but disciples and Jesus? Is there ever going to be a time when we answer disciples or Jesus? Or do we always see ourselves in the place of needing, you know, place of need, place of Struggle. Jesus, I need you. That's a good prayer. But does, there, does it ever shift away from what I need to maybe what Jesus needs me to be about? Does it ever get to that place? We think, well, we're sinners, you know, we, how, how can we do this? We, we don't, we're not able, we're, 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 we're stuck in our 
stuff. Remember the scripture, because while we were yet sinners, he first loved us. He's already loving us. He's already meeting our needs. He's already there for us. This is what Christianity is finally to be about, to be imitators of Jesus, to imitate Him, to be more like Him, to be His followers. Paul put it this way, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Through our years in church, many of us have heard that we need to learn more about the Bible. We've learned to, we need to know more about, you know, our faith. We need to grow. We need to learn. We need to be coming to church. We need to be taking in uh, what we can. We need to be part of groups, and uh, we need to, to do what we can to, 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 you know, to love God, to follow Jesus. But at some point, it needs to be something like, okay, I get it. It's time for me to step up. I'm responsible. I'm responsible for putting this into action. I'm responsible for living this. If who we say Jesus is, is Lord and Savior, and we want to be like Him, then we need to be doing more like what He does. More like you, what we just sang. Not just more like you in thinking, but more like you in, in our behaving and acting. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul says, surprisingly, For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. I regard everything as lost because of the surprising value of knowing Christ as my Lord. Christ as Lord. Lord of my whole life. Lord of everything. The gospel provides, provides us with a design for our lives so that we have something that we can aspire and work towards, not only revere, merely to praise Jesus in all of his majesty and all of his wonder, all the things that are in the bulletin this morning about Jesus. Yes, all of that. But if all that happens is we come and we, have our, we, we say our prayers and we have our heads down and we're we're kneeling low and we see Jesus up on high. I, that isn't what Je where Jesus wants to leave us. That is not what he wants of us. We need to get there, yes. But there's a time to stand up and say, here I am, send me. I'm going. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm the one. I heard a rabbi friend uh, over... Beth Shalom, this is one of the congregations we had our, our um, racism circle discussions with, right? So, so Rabbi Susan Grossman was saying that the, in the Talmud, there's a discussion about who was the first person that put their foot into the Red Sea? You know, who was, who was the first one that said, oh, you know, when Moses and God are said, you need to cross the, you need to take that step into the Red Sea? And there's a tradition about who that person was, there's a time to be that person, to put, our, to put our foot out there. Jesus said you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. We're to be more loving. Love is a verb. Love is action. Love isn't just thinking. Sometimes husbands have to learn this about our wives, right? Right? Love is a verb, <laughs> it's not just a thought. C.S. Lewis said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw people into Christ to make them little Christs. <laughs> if they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became human for no other person than to make us like Christ. There's a lot about Jesus, let me step back a minute, a lot about Jesus Christ, um, about who he is, who he was, who he continues to be. Think about, think about this, has anybody had more impact on the world in 2,000 years than him? 
certainly on the Western world, maybe on the rest of the world as well. When we think about it, he's the dominant figure, he and his followers, in our culture. So that means ideas, inventions, values, teachings, art, science, self and society, politics, economics, marriage and the family, right and wrong, body and soul, the whole nature of love. What does love look like? How do we, how do we engage? How do we live it? have all been touched by Jesus, all find its source, all those things. Not just a dead person, not just a, a good person from the past. He's continually influencing all of this for us. And we have to say, I, I need to say, uh, people who are, who are not coming from this place will see that, oh yeah, 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 and, Jesus, and, and Christians are the source of a lot of suffering and atrocities, and terrible things, you know, have been done in Jesus' name. We need to, uh, we need to accept that and need to uh, admit that. That's what some people, that's the first thing they see. You know, Christians, whoa, you know. So we need to continually look at what are we doing? Are we really doing it in Jesus' name? Is it really of Jesus? Or who wouldn't, is the truth that he wouldn't recognize what some of these things are? He'd be horrified beyond that as to what some of these things that have been done is in his name. We need to say that as, as well. We need to admit when we're wrong. Disciples aren't always right. Just because we use the name of Jesus doesn't mean that we can do whatever. So there's a, cert, there's a humility to this. This idea of never admitting we're wrong, I don't know where that comes from. That is not Christianity. That is not discipleship. So we need to find, you know, our, our ways of following and, and being, you know, asking the question, is this really of Jesus or is this really of me? So we need to do that. That's part of, part of the walk. Be willing to admit where we are going off track. Kierkegaard said this. He said, Christ's whole life in all its aspects must supply the norm for the life of the disciple and thus for the life of the whole church. His whole life and all of its aspects are the norm for discipleship, individually and for the church as a whole. So there's a story about an alcoholic. This is, he's in New York. This is in the Bowery. This is in one of those missions where the guys come. And uh, there's a guy named Joe who was there. Uh, he was the worst kind of person. He was helpless and hopeless, right? He was... He was not good for much of anything. Uh, Antisocial, he was, you know, rude, he was, you know, in people's faces all the time, angry, dirty, smelly, everything. But he had a conversion experience, and after that, Joe's life totally shifted. So he became somebody who couldn't do enough for people. He just wanted to help wherever he could, so uh, when these guys would come in, he'd be there to serve them. And, you know, when they got sick, when they'd vomit on the floor, he'd clean it up. Now, he was there to, to, to support, to be there, to be, you know, Christ's presence for them. And he'd be the last person to leave, you know, first one there and last one to leave. Joe was an amazing presence at this particular place. So during one of the services um, that they have for these guys, and they're all sitting there, they're kind of sullen, looking straight, straight ahead, and you know, feeling the weight of, of, of what has been going on in their lives. One guy kind of looks up, starts to come towards the altar, and he's shouting out <laughs> these words. He says, oh God, make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. I want to be like Joe. I want to be, be just like Joe. And after the service, the pastor came over and sat down and put his arm around this, this particular guy and, and said, um, you know, what you might want to be saying and praying is make me more like Jesus rather than make me more like Joe. And the man looked up at the director, with a, with, uh, at the pastor with a kind of a funny look on his face and he said, is he like Joe?
Disciples have a heart for Jesus above all else, above all others. You know, just these few people that we've mentioned this morning, we have, we have Peter and we have Paul, uh, we have, we have C.S. Lewis, we have Kierkegaard, we have Joe. All are pointing towards Jesus. All are living their lives for Jesus. Discipleship doesn't always make sense. If we're waiting for this whole enterprise to make sense, we're going to be waiting for a long time. Now, we need to keep our minds engaged, need to be thinking through. We do need to, you know, put the best we have to it. But does it make sense to take a week off of work, drive eight hours, be in, on the, hot, in the hot sun, on a, on a roof, without uh, Wi-Fi, uh, with a bunch of kids, uh, exhausted when you come home? Does that make sense? What disciples, who, who we are and what we do doesn't always make sense. Serving to the outside, you know, onlooker doesn't make sense. Living like Christ is going to bring us into places where we don't do what we think what we normally do. Well, in fact, that is a great sign that we really are following him when we start to do something that we wouldn't have done on our own. We wouldn't, didn't think about it that way. That means we're allowing God to start to shift our thinking. And we allow, Jesus is starting to, to, you know, become more and more integrated into our everyday life. So Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. That much we get. That pithy place that we're talking about today, that discipleship edge, comes in the next one. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Why did he have to say that? That first part is sort of, we can do that. That second part, that's, that's the faith, that's the discipleship part. Couldn't Jesus be a little more reasonable about this? Give us a little bit of the spiritual stuff that we need, and then we can live the rest of our life and not really have to deal with, with him? Who does Jesus think he is anyway? saying, I am the way, I am the door, I am the truth, I am the life for you. I am your life, I am the light of the world for you. According to Jesus, life's meaning comes through cultivating a heart for him alone. Cultivating a heart for him. Jesus is the one to follow. What does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as your Lord and my Lord? How about this? Moving from Jesus is the leader of some aspects of my life to Jesus as my loving Lord is the leader of all aspects of my life. And Jesus may lead all of my life in accordance with my guidelines. Two, Jesus as my loving Lord may lead all of my life in whatever way he chooses for me. And from I give my all to Jesus for my fulfillment, Two, I give my all to Jesus as my loving Lord to follow his will for God's glory. The church in the New Testament isn't just a religious organization. We, we, we talk about the church this way. It's a business. It's an organization. It's a, yeah, 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 we have that aspect to us. But that's sort of like the bottom line. That's, that's, that's what I say to Mary Cup. You're, 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 you know, premarital folks. Your wedding license is like the bottom of it. That's not what it means to be married, is it? No, we're to be a movement of God's people. We're to be on, on, on the move. We're to be, we're to be ready to, to step out. To follow Jesus, to be in covenant, to be in relationship with, with him and with each other. A dynamic, missional community of believers who participate in the way and life of Jesus and his work in the world. Is that who we are? Is this, that's the question. 
Are you participating with Jesus in his work in the world? Is our church a witness of the loving Lord, of our loving Lord, Jesus Christ? Are we as incarnation? Can people see something about him in us? Glenmar Church, who do you say Jesus is? Let us pray. God, we hear these words, these timeless words, very present for us. They catch us up. They point us. They're pointed. Help us to pray into, this, into, the, into our response, not let it go, not let it be somebody else's question, but it, let it be our question. Let it, let it help to focus us and make us more like you. Amen.